If you'd like to learn how to use low dropout regulators in your electronics projects and how to avoid the pitfalls, then stick around. Welcome to the electronicshobbyblog.com. I'm your host, Dominic Soldano, and today we're talking low dropout regulators. Low dropout regulators, or LDOs, occupy a sweet spot between more traditional linear regulators, like the 7805, and more modern switching regulators. They offer significant advantages over both in the right application. What makes an LDO unique is that the voltage drop across the regulator itself, or the dropout voltage, required to maintain regulation is much smaller than in traditional linear regulators. A legacy linear regulator requires two to three volts or more across the device to maintain output regulation. An LDO can maintain output regulation with only a few hundred millivolts across it. Since power dissipation is a product of current times voltage, LDO regulators dissipate a lot less power than their traditional linear counterparts. LDO regulators are also much more efficient than linear regulators especially if you keep the dropout voltage low. They can have efficiencies of 80%, 90%, or more. They have low ripple. LDOs are ideal in low noise applications. In a switching regulator, noise can be a real issue. Switching regulators work by generating high frequencies in the 10 to 100 kilohertz region. That can lead to a lot of noise. LDOs are linear regulators and thereby have very low noise. A big advantage over switching regulators where noise is an issue, such as when seeking FCC certification for a product. They're very simple devices requiring no more than the regulator itself and a small capacitor at the input and the output. In addition, LDOs are very small in size. Some LDOs are as small as an SOT transistor. If we look at a traditional linear regulator like the 7805, we can see that in order to maintain regulation, it has to have at least two or more volts across the device. That means that in order to get five volts out, we need to have seven volts in. With an LDO regulator, the voltage across the device only needs to be a few hundred millivolts. For instance, looking at the LF33ABDT-TR, which is a 3.3 volt, 1.1 amp, LDO voltage regulator, to get a voltage out of 3.3 volts, we only need to have 3.6 volts or greater at the input. The device itself really only needs to have about 300 millivolts across it. That keeps the power dissipation way down and the efficiency way up. This makes them ideal for applications where the supply voltage is only slightly above the voltage required to operate the circuit, which is common in circuits powered by lithium ion batteries. While the battery voltage may start out at 4.1 or 4.2 volts, it drops to 3.7 volts rather quickly and then down to 3.6 volts before most electronics cut out. One big advantage of LDOs in battery powered circuits is that they have a much smaller quiescent current than either legacy linear or switching converters. Most LDOs, quiescent current when operating is in the one milliamp range, and in sleep mode, that drops to a few microamps. Gives them a great advantage over traditional linear or switching regulators. An LDO regulator differs from a traditional linear regulator in the pass element. Traditional linear regulators usually use a bipolar junction transistor or a Darlington pair as the pass element. And that normally requires from one to two volts or more dropout across the regulator. LDOs differ in that they use a field effect transistor as the pass element, which can have an on resistance in the milliohms, meaning that they need to drop very little across the regulator in order to maintain regulation. So that means that it needs to have a much lower source to drain voltage in order to keep conducting. It's the difference in pass elements, FET versus BJT, that allows an LDO regulator to have such a small dropout voltage. Let's look at what goes on inside a low dropout regulator. Here you see the block diagram of a simple low dropout regulator with a fixed voltage output. The device itself has an in and out and a ground. An internal voltage reference and a difference amp, which is set using a voltage divider, drive the pass element. Small capacitors at both the input and the output are the only additional components needed. Some LDOs have an enable pin that allows you to disable them 
during sleep operations so that you can get extremely low quiescent currents and extend battery life. Quiescent currents for a disabled LDO are down in the microamps. This is ideal in long-running battery-powered applications. LDO regulators are also available with an adjustable voltage output. Variable output LDOs move the voltage divider outside of the case and provide a pin for the reference voltage. LDO pass elements come in two varieties, P-channel and N-channel. LDOs with P-channel pass elements have a minimum voltage that has to be maintained on the input side in order to keep operating. And it's usually around 2.5 volts to keep the gate voltage biased at a point close to saturation. With an LDO regulator, the point is to run it very close to RDS on of the FET. That keeps the dropout voltage very low. Some LDOs with P-channel pass elements overcome this limitation by including a charge pump on the op amp. Others will include a separate reference voltage that you provide at the input along with the in. That separate reference element is used to ensure the minimum gate voltage on the pass element. LDOs that use an N-channel pass element use a negative voltage on the gate and thereby can achieve much lower input voltages. N-channel LDOs work with input voltages down in the one volt range. Let's look at some of the key parameters of a low dropout regulator. Dropout voltage is the minimum voltage across the device required to maintain regulation. Transient response measures the regulator's ability to perform when the load current changes very rapidly. Line regulation is the ability to maintain the output voltage while input voltage varies. Load regulation is the ability to maintain the rated output voltage as the load itself varies. Power supply rejection ratio, or PSRR, measures the device's ability to maintain the rated output voltage under varying load conditions across the entire frequency spectrum. Line regulation usually looks at changes in the 60 hertz range, what you would expect to come out of the wall outlet, where PSRR looks across the entire frequency spectrum. Output noise voltage is the output noise caused by the regulator itself. Regulator instability is any instability in the output voltage due to the compensation series resistor, which is based on the equivalent series resistor of the output filter capacitor. Regulator instability can be a real issue. Most LDOs will require some minimum capacitance on the input and the output. We'll look at a regulator today that requires 10 microfarads on the output. Now you might think, well, hey, if 10 microfarads is the minimum, why not put a big ol' honkin' 500 microfarad capacitor on the output and we'll filter everything out? The problem is that electrolytic capacitors, which is what you're going to find in a 500 microfarad capacitor, have a high ESR, or equivalent series resistance. That equivalent series resistance can cause real problems with regulator instability. In fact, you want to keep the ESR as low as possible with an LDO regulator. And the best way to do that is to use a tantalum capacitor instead of an electrolytic capacitor. Tantalum capacitors have a much lower ESR than the equivalent value of electrolytic capacitor, making them ideal for LDO type applications. Accuracy measures the LDO's ability to do its job across the entire spectrum of conditions it might encounter. Power dissipation and junction temperature are another important aspect of LDOs because they're normally very small devices. Many LDOs will need a capacitor at the input and the output. The one that we're looking at doesn't require an input capacitor. I'd probably put a microfarad or two there, but it does require a minimum of a one microfarad output capacitor for stability. One of the big tricks with designing for LDOs is to use a tantalum capacitor at the input and the output in order to ensure regulator stability. Let's take a look at a typical low dropout regulator that can supply one amp of output current. So here's a typical adjustable LDO with an enable pin. This works with an input voltage range of 2.2 to 5.5 volts. My guess is that this has a P-channel pass element because of the 2.2 volt minimum requirement. Notice that at one amp, the dropout voltage is typically about 130 millivolts. That means that if we set the output for 3.3 volts, we really only need about 3.5 volts 
at the input. So this is ideally what we want if we're going to operate something off of lithium ion batteries. Look at the eye ground or the quiescent current. At 1 amp, it's only about 1.3 milliamps. So that's really good and very efficient. And at 10 milliamps output, it's only about 400 microamps. If we put it into shutdown mode by grounding the enable pin, it draws only 20 nanoamps. That's very important if we're talking about running a circuit for a long time off a battery. We can see the PSLRR at 100 hertz and 10 kilohertz. Since this LDO includes an enable pin, we can see the minimum required enable high and low voltages as well as the current that leaks into the enable pin. Again, note that these LDO regulators keep those quiescent currents and pin currents very low in order to boost efficiency for battery applications. Now, using that same regulator as an example, Let's go back and look at some of those key parameters. If we need 3.3 volts at the output and the minimum dropout voltage is 0.3 volts, then we need at least a minimum of 3.6 volts at the input. If the quiescent current is 1 milliamp and we're going to push 1 amp through this, that means the input current needs to be 1 amp plus 1 milliamp, right? That 1 milliamp heads down the ground leg. And the standby current is equal to I in minus I out, which as we saw earlier for a different regulator, was about 20 nanoamps. So if we take these numbers, we were getting one amp out at 3.3 volts with 3.6 volts in and one milliamp in the ground leg, and we look at the efficiency, we can see that this LDO regulator is 91.6% efficient. That's much, much greater than you're going to find in any traditional old style linear regulator like the 7805 or the 7812. That kind of comes close to what most switching regulators can achieve. And if we look at the power dissipation, you know, given that we're only dropping 0.3 volts or 300 millivolts and drawing about one amp through the regulator, and we look at E times I to get the power dissipation, it's only about 300 milliwatts. That doesn't probably require any heat sinking at all, depending on the size of the device. LDOs tend to be much smaller devices than traditional linear regulators. So thermal management can be a big issue. Choosing the right case style for your particular application and mounting it correctly will go a long way toward helping you address thermal issues. You'll get the best thermal performance from your LDO if you choose a case style that will solder directly to your board. A leadless case that solders directly to the board will have the best heat transfer characteristics and use your PC board as the heat sink itself. This will save space and help keep the chip cool. The metal to solder to copper provides excellent heat transference. Now let's go into the lab and take a look at an LDO in practical use. This is the device we'll be looking at in the lab. It's an LDL1117 LDO regulator. It's got a pretty wide input voltage range and it's available in a number of different fixed outputs. The one we're looking at is the 3.3 volt and it's in a SOT223 package, which I've soldered to a breakout board. Here are the parameters we'll be looking at. We'll be looking at turn on threshold and dropout voltage. I've set up a small test circuit in the lab. The recommended capacitance on the input and output for this particular chip is one microfarad on the input and 4.7 microfarad on the output. I didn't have any tantalum capacitors in those values, so we're using electrolytic capacitors. We're gonna test it under three different load cases. 10 ohms, which will give us 330 milliamps approximately. 33 ohms, which will give us about 100 milliamps approximately, and then 330 ohms, which should give us 10 milliamps approximately. Here you can see the circuit set up with the SOT device soldered onto the breakout board. All right, so I've got the circuit set up on the bench, and the first thing we're gonna look at is the turn on voltage. So excuse my arm, but I'm gonna start slowly dialing this up and we'll see when it actually turns on. One volt still hasn't turned on, one and a quarter volts and still hasn't turned on, one and a half, one and three quarters. There's two volts, two and a quarter. There we go. So turn on was right around 2.3 volts. All right, so I brought it up to four volts and the output voltage is 3.278. Right, 3.277, 3.278. And let's start bringing the voltage down and look at what happens as far as dropout goes. 
So what we want to look for is we want to look for when the input starts following, or excuse me, when the output starts following the input. So 3.78 still. It's warming up. Okay, so there's, there we go. So at uh, 3.56 volts, we're at uh, 3.278. Still there at 3.5 volts. There we go. And so right below 3.5 volts, the output starts following the input. So this is a 3.3 volt LDO, which means that the dropout voltage where it starts to drop out is right around 200 millivolts. And you'll see if we continue to lower this, the output voltage will follow the input voltage. Okay, so I've changed the load to a 33 ohm resistor, which is now giving us 100 milliamps of output current. And now let's take a look again at the dropout voltage. So right now it's reading 2.79. We're down to 3.6 volts, which is 300 millivolts across the device. Three point five, two hundred millivolts across the device. Still holding steady. So it's still holding steady with only 100 millivolts across the device. There we go. So at this point, it starts to follow the input. So it looks like right around 50 millivolts across the device. So that's a pretty good dropout, 50 millivolts at uh, 100 milliamps. At this point, I've changed the load to 330 ohms, which is giving us 10 milliamps of output. And I've returned the input voltage to 4 volts. And we've got 3.279. So let's start dropping this. And I'm going to go fairly quickly to 3.5. So that's 200 millivolts across the device. 3.4 is only 100 millivolts across the device. And it holds right up to 3.3. Of course, this is a regulated supply, so we'd be seeing ripple. But the lower the current, the less voltage it needs across the device. Well, I hope you enjoyed that and learned quite a bit about low dropout regulators. If you did, then how about a thumbs up and a share and smash that subscribe button. Until next time, cheers.